was trying and trying and trying to express what real worship looks like and that it's not three songs and sit down and, and you know, like how to express our hearts in worship and, and just look back on those days and they, you know, when I took the words down because I'm like, stop singing karaoke on the wall, stop doing that, take the walls down and the words down. And for six months, we had no words. And it was the first bit of persecution I ever received (laughs) was for taking the words off the wall. So we couldn't sing. We had to connect, you know, and looking back on those days and looking where we are today. I am just so grateful for your hearts of worship and how we continue to build true hearts of worship. You know, I don't care if we spend an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours worshiping God, worshiping him. I mean, worshiping Jesus, worshiping God for what he's done is so important. And it is a blessing to him. And if we did nothing other than genu- genuinely worship him, we have will have done everything we need to do in this service. Because he is amazing. You know, Billy Graham, of course, everybody knows Billy Graham went home to be with the Lord this week. And this is the first Sunday in a hundred years almost that Billy Graham has not been here on this earth a hundred years he was almost a hundred years old how phenomenal is that i mean i just am i when i heard that he passed away i was excited i was so happy you know because i knew that that was what he wanted he'd longed for so long just to go home and be with the lord and that to this morning i've just been brought to tears a hundred times in this service That's an exaggeration, but many times in this service, I've been brought to tears because one of the things that he said was that if he could do it all over again, he would spend more time, less time in the smaller meetings that he did because he was, you know, he spoke up uh, three times a day, three times a day, three meetings a day. I listened to him today in an interview And he said that he spoke three times a day in different meetings. They would have to jet him here, here, and here every day, almost every day of his life over a certain huge amount. He said that it took away from his time of worship. It took away from his time of preparation. It took away, or not preparation, but of prayer and being in the presence of God. And he said that if he was to do it all over again, he would do less of those. He said he wouldn't do less of the big ones, but he would do less of the small ones. And he would spend more time reading his Bible and telling the Lord how much he loved him and meditating. Please don't ever feel like a longer worship service is a waste of time. There is not one minute you spend telling Jesus how much you love him that is a waste of time. Life is busy and we need to honor God with our time and with our praises and with our worship because he is so magnificent. You know, there has been rarely a man of God that has been celebrated like this man of God. I just want you to put those pictures up for me up here. This is the home going. This is a motorcade. How many men of God get a motorcade? They need a motorcade to get to their resting place. There, you should see the pictures. There are limousine after limousine following this man in. And this is him going home. Look at the people. Look at the people. Look at the lives. Look at the lives. One man, one life completely sold out to the gospel of Jesus Christ can touch. Go to the next one. Look at from as far as the eye can see. It's like Santa Claus is coming to town. Man, it's better than when Santa Claus comes to town. This is the effects of what one life sold out to the cause of Jesus Christ can do. One life. He was a farm boy. He was a farm boy back before there were cars all over the place back before hardly any roads were playing where roads were paved back before there were airplanes. He said there were no airplanes. 
No, like people weren't just jet setting all over the place. He said hardly anybody had a car. A farm boy. Go to the next one for me. Look at this. When you die, when I die, is any like seriously the lives this man has touched. It's 2018. It's 2018 when it's not cool to love Jesus. It's not cool to be a preacher. It's still not cool to be a woman preacher. But this man spent almost a hundred years, about 80 years. He was 18 or 19 years old when he got saved and gave his life to the Lord. And he went immediately into preparation because he believed that the Lord had spoke to him, that he was going to be a preacher of the gospel to the nations. He went immediately into preparation. Go to the next slide. I think there's one more. Look at people hanging this nation's flags of nations up above the highway because they knew he was going to be his body was going to pass by just to be able to honor the man just to be able to get a glimpse of the car that his casket was in you know what I cannot believe it just started hitting me this morning when I was in the shower then one life one life one life of a boy that used to milk 20 cows a day twice a day when he was when he received the gospel of Jesus and it wasn't just mere words and it wasn't just an escape route to be able to believe that somehow he would be secure and live in heaven one day. It was a man who truly, truly was impacted by the words of Jesus Christ, by the truth of the blood of Jesus and what the blood of Jesus had done. One life, one life took the seed, continued to sow the seed of the word of God into himself. He didn't need other people to sow. He was sown into, he went to school, he sat under great preachers and everything, but he did not leave it to anyone else to sow the seed into his own life he sowed the seed into his own life and we must be sowing seed into our own lives reading the gospel believing the gospel reading the gospel believing the gospel reading the gospel of Jesus Christ it changed him to the point where millions and millions of people worldwide are mourning the death of Billy Graham to me, what this says to me is that one life matters. Your life matters. He never kept his mouth quiet. He loved everyone, but he never, ever kept his praises uh, chained up within him. He constantly praised the Lord. He did not ever keep the gospel contained within him. He continually was a vessel of releasing the gospel and the love and the power of Jesus Christ. One man needed a barricade to be buried a barricade a motorcade to be buried one life one life i was up here just crying at the altar god just let my life mean something for you god just let my life represent you well i don't need a motorcade i don't need anything all i need is to be received into the arms of my savior well done you did not keep your praises held captive within your body well done you did not keep my word held captive within your body you released it you released it you know we are we are victims of what society tells us we have to be. You are Christians. You are not victims. You are Christians. You have been set free from all that society dictates about you. You are the beloved of Jesus Christ and you have received for yourself the very words of life. The very words that have taken you from prison and set you free. The very words that have taken you from death and given you life and life eternal and life abundant while you're here in the earth. It's not something you're meant to keep to yourself. It's something we need to share. This man shared it unashamedly unashamedly and I know that he suffered persecution and stuff at times throughout the years I'm sure he did different sorts but he didn't bellyache and he certainly did not stop he didn't stop he did not stop 
And I just want to encourage you today to know that your life matters. If you have been touched by the power of Jesus Christ, your life, your words, your love, they're not just meant for you. It's meant for the world. It's meant for the world. I cannot tell you how deeply and profoundly affected I've been this morning. I didn't think the whole lot of it up the, up until this morning when the Lord just started hitting me with it in the shower this morning. Your life can affect the souls of other people. You know, the prophetic words are saying that and this was spoken years before Billy Graham passed away by Benny Hinn and a few others that when the seed of the life of Billy Graham was sown into the ground that there would be the greatest move of God a great evangelism awakening and it, it, it is but you know what it's coming but the thing is is here's what I want to tell you don't sit and wait for it get up and do it that's how things happen, you know. I mean, don't be one of the ones that sits back and waits to watch somebody do something. Wait and watch this move of evangelism. How about we wake up and become the move of evangelism? That, that, that didn't need to wait until Billy Graham died. That is constantly, readily right there. But I believe that the Spirit of God is churning. He's churning, he's churning, and he's saying... May the earth be filled with the knowledge of my glory. May the earth be filled with the knowledge of my glory. And you have within you the knowledge of the glory of God. You have within you the ability to make societal change. You have within you the ability to see the captive set free. You have the ability. So let's not sit back and wait for this move to start somewhere somewhere else in far reaching corners of the earth or, or somewhere else within Canada how about let's let the move begin within us how about we say yes Holy Spirit begin to change me begin to challenge me begin Lord God to spark the, the uh, desire for evangelism within my soul how about we come into agreement with what the prophetic word is saying? That's what it takes for a prophetic word to come to pass is for someone, some people to, to say, yes, I believe that's the Lord. Yes, I'm going to come into agreement with it. I'm going to covenant with it, with it. Because after all, it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives inside of me. That Christ that lives through me, Christ that lives in me. What do you have to fear? When it's not you that's living, it's Christ that's living in you and through you. What do you have to fear when it's not your reputation, but it's his? And how you know, he vindicates his reputation. He's not going to vindicate yours, but he will vindicate his. He will, sh he will shelter you. He will vindicate you. And it is his reputation that he vindicates within the earth. And if we will allow the reputation of the Lord to be made manifest through us, he will always be there vindicating always be there. You don't have to worry about anything. You do not have to worry about it. Now, one thing that Billy Graham did was he was a, he was a, he was absolutely meticulous about the love that he delivered the word in. Because the one thing we don't want is a revival of religious bantering and accusations we want the word of God to be released from a place of love, of compassion, of true connection with the Father. One life, one life. Billy Graham lived his life to the fullest of its absolute capability to honor and glorify God. I heard him quote this morning, I heard him quote um, somebody, some friend of his that said, you know, you are not rich based on what you have. You are rich based on what you can live without. And I thought that that was really profound because, you know, as Christians, a lot of us in our modern day age, we fall into the trap 
of believing that success as a Christian is how much you can acquire. It is not that. It is not that. It doesn't matter, might I add, how much money you have in your bank account at the end of the day. It's how much glory have you brought to the Lord. There's nothing wrong with having money in your bank account. I mean, God gives us the power to get wealth. Don't take what I say and throw it into the other side. But what I'm telling you is, is if you are trying to find success based on what you acquire in this lifetime, you are, you are, you are wrong in your thinking. It's not about what you can acquire. It's about how much of God can you acquire. It's about how much of God can you release. Because when you become a preacher of the gospel, you are not guaranteed palatial homes, yet we strive for it. You are not guaranteed the greatest and newest make and model of cars and everything else. But yet we strive for it. And I don't want us to be that type of a Christian that strives for that. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you my husband and I, and this is not for in any way to, I don't know, make you think something is not meant to make you think, but my husband and I have emptied ourselves of everything, including our bank account to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the coolest things to me is that I have a nice office (laughs) and I have a nice little home. But you know, if I didn't have either of those two things, I'd still be preaching the gospel to somebody because somebody's willing to listen. Somebody needs to hear. And we have emptied everything. We do not. We do not consider ourselves successful based on our bank account or else we would be absolutely unsuccessful. We would be. My husband and I successful based on the fact that we can live without everything, but I cannot live without Jesus. I cannot live without Jesus. And I cannot live without allowing my life to pour out what it is that he's given me. Because I see way too many people calling themselves Christians and walking around living like anything but what I see the Bible telling us to live. I've lost friends. I've lost my reputation. And honestly, I don't care. Because I've gained a reputation with my Lord. And I say this to kind of maybe recalibrate the thinking of some of you if it's necessary. I wasn't planning on saying any of this. I was planning on showing you some pictures. But I don't want you to fall into the trap of modern day Christianity that says that you have to have in order to be successful. You don't. You have to have Jesus. You have to have the knowledge of the word of God. You have to have a love that is beyond your own ability, your own capability. You have to have the courage and the boldness to stand up for what is right, regardless of what it costs you. You have to have the boldness and the courage to confess to anyone, anytime, anywhere that you are a God-loving, God-fearing man and woman. And if that's all you have, you've had it, you have enough. Amen? Amen. God is good. He is good. The overwhelming impact of the life of the overwhelming impact of a life completely committed to God is shown in Billy Graham. We may not all have, have, we may not all have the opportunity to preach to millions of people, but you have the opportunity to preach to one And when I say preach, I mean share, not thump with your Bible and show them just how witty you are and how many scriptures you can quote. They don't care. People don't care. I personally don't care how many scriptures you can quote. 
I care how many you can live. I care how many you can love. And if you can quote them, that's a bonus. But don't use it to oppress because it's not your ability that will save. It's the ability of God to woo. It's the ability of God to use you. But he needs humble, willing vessels. And like Diane was saying, don't be afraid. Don't think God can't move on those that are unsaved. He came for the sick. He didn't come for the well. He came for those that needed him. And he's sending you to those who need them. I can't wait to see what the Lord does with this place. I can't wait until our expansion when we take over this next building next door is not enough. Because of our hearts for the lost. Because of our hearts to save those that are lost and dying. Because of church that's like a hospital where you can come in and experience the presence of the Lord. Come in sick and leave well. And you know, Billy Graham suffered from Parkinson's disease. Did you know that? He, for a long, long time, he suffered for, with Parkinson's disease and all kinds of different things. He had a lot, he had quite a few things wrong with him. He was an older, old man. But I can bet you, as a man of God, that Billy Graham did not mumble, complain, question, or blame his God. Because he had some sickness in his body. And there's a difference, you know. Because it's another trap that us modern day Christians fall into. I believe in healing. I've laid hands on many, many sick and seen many, many, many miraculous healings. I've been miraculously healed myself. And I believe in healing. But I believe the ultimate healing comes when we go to be with the Lord. I believe that that's when the 100% guarantee is released to us. Is that when we go home to be with the Lord. You know I was thinking this week about the scripture that says. To live is Christ and to die is gain. And I always thought what the heck do you mean? Like what? What do you mean? And I just had this thought in my mind. And this is what I'm sticking with. To live is for Christ. To die is for me. Yeah. Because I've never really got it. Like it's a good saying and I pretended like I knew what it meant, but I never did. And I was just thinking, what is it, Lord? What are you saying? And I just felt like he said, to live is to live for Christ. To die is for me. And you know, when you believe that, that death is actually a gift to us, that our reason for living is for Christ. It is so that the gospel can be made manifest within the earth. It's so that the kingdom of God can be made manifest in the earth as it is in heaven, Lord God. And you live your life with that focus, that your life literally is to be an expression and a manifestation of the kingdom of God here in the earth. And death is a gift to you then you've got nothing to fear. Nothing. Nothing to fear. Isn't that beautiful? Because fear grips and it chokes out your ability even to live for Christ. It's faith that releases the ability to live for Christ. And when, you know, we live in a fallen and broken world where the world is continually breaking down. Your mortal bodies can be affected by it, but your spirits can't be if your spirit is encompassed by the love and the power and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's your spirit that will live forever, not your body. 
It's a beautiful thing. And like Billy Graham says, it's only a change of address. Isn't that good? You know, I want to encourage anyone who might be dealing with um, any type of illness or supposed life-threatening illness. You know, for a Christian, there's no such thing. No such thing as a life-threatening illness. None. Cancer can't kill you because you can't die. You just get a change of address. And if we can shift our focus to think like that, that we are here for the purposes of God, not our own purposes. And if we can live as though this, we know we're all going to die at some point. And if we can live that way and live with the expectation and the hope of the fullness of glory being fulfilled when we do die, then death is not a problem. And disease is not scary when we can get a hold and grasp the revelation of it. It's not fun. And it's not optimal. And it wasn't God's first plan. But when your heart gets gripped with fear, fear feeds disease. But if your heart is continually gripped with faith, faith heals all the disease tries to take from you. There is nothing the enemy cannot steal, or the, nothing the enemy can steal from you as a believer if you'll hold on to it. And he can't take your life because you can't die. You're going to live forever. Your eternal life has already started. And I find that very encouraging. And I want you to remember that. Billy Graham had Parkinson's disease. You cannot tell me that man lived in sin. You cannot tell me that man was not a radical, on fire, devoted lover of Jesus Christ. You cannot tell me that man did not believe in healing. You cannot tell me that man was not honored and respected by God. And yet he still suffered some disease in his body. And I'm talking about this for my friends who believe that no Christians are not allowed to have any type of thing wrong with their body. It's all, it is all sin related. This whole problem with this whole world is sin related. But it has no bearing on your life expectancy. You're expected to live forever. Just not here. You get a change of address. And you don't even have to go to the post office. <laughs> And fill out those pesky forms. Amen. Wow, God is beautiful. I mean, I just feel the presence of God so strong in this place today. And I'm so grateful to you, and I love you so much. I love you. And I'm so grateful that you are partnering with us and you are walking with us to to make a change, to literally affect this world for the kingdom of God, to grow up and just to not be baby Christians after you've been saved for 40 years, to be emboldened and to live your life out loud. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I promise you, if I died tomorrow, I would die so happy and so fulfilled because I know that I touched somebody for Jesus. It's all that I want with my life is to make a difference. I used to be a mess. I used to be one of the biggest messes. I used to be so insecure. I didn't love myself. I've been beaten, battered, abused. All of it, you all know. But I stand before you here free and ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to do whatever it takes to bring glory and honor to my God. I'm ready to stand up against the wiles of the devil. I'm ready to preach the word of God till I'm blue in the face. I don't care. My God didn't tell me that ovaries disqualify me from preaching the gospel. My God and my Bible do not tell me that ovaries disqualify me from being able to lead a charge of people. My God tells me differently. 
there is neither no male nor female in the kingdom of God. And I don't live here in this. I don't live here in this world. I live here, but I'm not of this world. I'm of the kingdom. And in the kingdom of God, there is no male nor female in Christ. So people can try to disqualify me all they want because I got a set of ovaries. But I know Jesus didn't place me and my call inside of the wrong body. And these ovaries are going to celebrate and praise and preach until the day they don't got ovaries no more. Amen. (laughs) Amen. God is good. God is good. And I release your ovaries to preach as well. 